Welcome to another tutorial video. This time we're going to cover a very specific topic, as you can see on screen, the book value versus market value versus face value of bonds or debt and how to keep all these terms straight. So we get a lot of questions about this topic and the accounting rules have changed somewhat over the years, which further adds to some of the confusion here. The typical question we get goes something like this. What is the difference between the book value, market value, and face value of a bond? What appears on a company's financial statements? And how do these concepts change the interest expense and other calculations for the debt? So as always, I'm going to give you a short answer up front. Then we're going to look at some examples of how to calculate these numbers and how to project them in Excel. And then I'll give you one example at the end that will combine everything and show how all these concepts together work. The first thing to note before getting into this is that book value, market value, and face value apply to more than just debt. They apply to equity and sometimes other items, other forms of securities and assets, but we're focusing exclusively on a company's debt here. Face value is the amount of debt that a company issues, pays interest on, and then must repay upon maturity. Book value is the debt that shows up on a company's balance sheet under liabilities and equity, but it is not necessarily the amount that the company pays interest on or the amount that it must eventually repay upon maturity. And then market value is what someone else would pay to buy the company's debt on the secondary market if it trades on a secondary market. So if a company issues debt for a thousand and then interest rates change, the amount that debt is going to be worth to a new investor will be different from a thousand in almost all cases. And the market value represents what it's worth to that new investor coming in. The face value of a bond is only affected by debt issuances, principal repayments, and then if there is any accrued or paid in kind interest that instead of being paid in cash, simply accrues to the loan principal and increases over time. So those are the only things that should affect the face value. The book value is also affected by all those, but it's also affected by issuance fees when the bond or other debt is first issued, as well as any discount or premium when the bond is first issued, and the amortization of both those items over time. And then the market value of a bond is based on the future interest payments, market interest rates on similar debt, and the future repayment upon maturity. So in practice, for the market value, the bond's current coupon rate versus market rates on similar bond issuances and the credit default risk of the issuer make the biggest impact. And especially for healthy companies, it really all comes down to the coupon rate versus market rates. Credit default risk plays more of a role if the company is distressed or there are otherwise some doubts about its business viability. Let's go into the first Excel example here and look at simple debt issuances and repayments for this company, Toro. To give you some background, this company is spending a lot of money and it needs to issue additional debt in several years of our model. And you can see that up here. I just have a portion of this on screen. In several years, the company has a minimum cash balance, but in the last three years shown here, they actually go below that minimum cash balance. And so they need to borrow some additional debt. And we test that with a minimum function in Excel. So the face value goes up when new debt is issued and it goes down when there's a repayment or maturity. Let's take a look at that. So here I have the face value of the debt and you can see it starts out at 314.9 million and it stays the same in the first two years because nothing is issued and nothing is repaid. But then in year three, they have to issue additional debt. And so the face value goes up from 314.9 million to 339.6 million. Then it goes up the next year. And then in the final year, we have an issuance and we also have a repayment or maturity for that debt. So this is how the face value changes. Now, this is the face value, the ending balance. Notice how on the balance sheet, if we go down and take a look at this, these numbers do not match the actual face value of the debt. So the book value of the debt changes based on all these factors, but we also need to deduct the financing fee on new issuances, and we need to add the amortization of those financing fees over 10 years, since we're assuming that each issuance here will be outstanding for 10 years. Let's take a look at that in Excel. So here we can see the book value of debt, the beginning and ending numbers and everything that changes them in between. So we still have the debt issuances and repayments that affect this, but we also have the amortization of issuance fees and the deduction 
for new issuance fees. The deduction for new issuance fees is based on whatever amount we issue times this 2% number that we're assuming for the issuance fee percentage. And you can see this in each year. And then the amortization of issuance fees, we simply sum up the starting amount of our issuance fees, what we had in the beginning, and then anything additional over time. And then we divide by 10. This is not exactly a scalable approach, but it works in a very simple model over four or five years when we don't have to worry about making it truly completely flexible. The basic point is that fees are deducted, they're amortized over time, and then as they're amortized, they increase the book value of the debt. You have to be really careful here because a long time ago, the accounting rules were different. They've changed under US GAAP. They were always like this under IFRS, but now these fees are deducted and amortized directly from the book value of debt over time. And if you're wondering about the market value here, the short answer is we have no idea what it is. We don't know the current market interest rates. Now the company is paying about 6.1% for its coupon rate on this debt, but we don't know how that compares to the market rates at all. So if this is significantly higher than the current market rates, then the debt is going to trade at a premium and it's going to be worth more than its face value. But if this is significantly below the market rates, then the market value is going to be below the face value of the debt. Normally, we have to look this up on Bloomberg or another financial information source like that to figure out what the market value is. Let's look at another Excel example now for a convertible bond for another company, Atlassian. So this company, Atlassian, is a software company. They issued a convertible bond a long time ago, and we're assuming a five-year maturity here. So let's take a look at how this works. Now, convertible bonds are often separated into equity and debt components to reflect how they have a dual nature. Initially, they're debt, but if the company's share price reaches a certain level, they may be converted into equity, into shares. This debt component, or the book value, equals the face value minus the unamortized issuance fees, which we just saw in our previous example for Toro, minus the debt discount. This debt discount represents how much more the bond would be worth if it had a normal interest rate of 4 to 5%, rather than a very low rate of 0.625%. Let's take a look at this. The stated interest rate on this convertible issuance is below 1%, 0.625%. But for an equivalent non-convertible bond, it would be more like 4.5 or 4.6%. And the unamortized debt discount here represents this difference in value and says that over five years or 10 years or however long the bond is outstanding, if this were a traditional bond instead, it would be worth about 173 million more. So that's how this is recorded. The face value of the bond is simply 1,000, but initially our starting point here, the book value is only around 820 million because it reflects a deduction for the issuance fee and for that unamortized debt discount. Now the face value here never changes until the end because there are no additional issuances, there's no accrued or paid in kind interest, and there's only a single maturity at the very end of the period. So you can see that in our Excel right here. It starts at 1,000 and it stays at 1,000 going all the way across. Now, of course, if you look at the balance sheet, this is not what's shown on the balance sheet. We have long-term debt here going up from 820 to 961 by the end, and then eventually it goes to zero in the final year when the repayment, the maturity happens. The cash interest here never changes because the cash interest is based on this constant face value. So you see right here, the contractual interest expense, this is just based on the 0.625% times the face value of 1,000 every single year. So this does not change at all because the face value doesn't change and the interest rates don't change. The book value keeps increasing because the debt discount is amortized over time and the issuance fees are also amortized over time. So let's take a look at this. For our beginning book value here, we do factor in the principal repayments and maturity. So that is a part of it, but we're also factoring in the amortization of the debt discount and the amortization of the debt issuance fees. The debt issuance fees are fairly simple and straightforward. We just take the starting amount and divide by the number of years until maturity, and that's how we get that number. The amortization of the debt discount gets more complicated, and I don't want to get into it for right now, but suffice to say, it's roughly the same as that approach, but it increases slightly over time as the book value of the debt here keeps going up. The exact mechanics are unimportant. Just be aware that it increases slightly over time when you have a convertible bond issued like this. The book value finally reaches zero at the same time as the face value reaches zero when the convertible bond matures in year five. 
With the market value, again, if you're wondering, we have no idea what it is. We'd have to look it up on Bloomberg or another source or see if the company gives an estimate in its filings because we don't know how these interest rates, 0.625%, 4.56% compare to the current prevailing market interest rates. If we knew that, or we knew the probability of at lasting repaying the bond, we could try to estimate this ourselves. With the market value of a convertible bond, you need to count all the components of a bond. So you need to count it as either 100% debt or 100% equity when you're using it in calculations like enterprise value. So it would be closer to the face value if we're counting it as debt, because we need to include both the debt and equity components. And so we would use some variation of this effective interest rate here. And so the market value of the debt in this case would be something closer to the face value. It would not just be this 820 million book value because we'd have to think about this as if it were a traditional non-convertible bond to get the market value in this case. Those are a few Excel examples. Let's look at one final example here, as I call it, one example to rule them all, which will unify these concepts and give you a simpler way to think about this. Let's say a company issues a 1,000 10-year bond at a 5% coupon rate and market rates on similar bonds are 6.35%. There are no repayments, so there's just bullet maturity at the end when all 1,000 are due. Due to this below market rate, 5% versus 6.35%, the bond is issued at a $100 discount. So it's issued for only 900, even though the company has to repay all 1,000 and must pay interest on all 1,000. The face value here would be 1,000 initially, and it never changes until maturity because there are no repayments and there's no paid in kind or accrued interest and there's no additional issuances here. The cash interest each year would just be the 5%, the coupon rate, times that 1000 face value. And so it would be $50 per year until maturity. The book value, which shown on the balance sheet, would be different because we need to take the face value, we need to subtract out this initial discount, and we need to subtract out the issuance fee. We're saying 2% here, so 2% times 1,000 is 20. And so the amount shown on the balance sheet would be 880, the book value initially. The market value here, we would say that initially it's a face value of 1,000, so we subtract the 100 discount. We could use the price function in Excel to verify all this, by the way. And so we'd say the market value here initially is 900. So it reflects the discount, but not the issuance fees. The book value will change based on the amortization of the discount and the amortization of the issuance fees each year. So after the first year, we take that 880 initial starting balance. We take the 100 discount and divide by the 10 year maturity. And we take the issuance fees of 20 and divide by the 10 year maturity. We add those up and we get to 892 by the end of year one. And then for year two, we do the same thing. We start with 892, we add those up, and we get to 904 by the end. So the book value here goes up by 12 per year until the bond matures. With the market value, we don't know how it's going to change because, again, we don't know how future interest rates will change. We know what they are right now, but we don't know how they're going to change in year three or year five. So this is not necessarily something that you can project in the same way that you can project the book value of the bond. If interest rates go up, the market value will fall because investors can get higher rates elsewhere. If interest rates go down, then the market value will increase because this bond by comparison looks more appealing now. If credit default risk rises, the market value will fall because there's a lower repayment probability. Even if the repayment probability is only 99.5% instead of 100% or 99.9%, that does make a difference and the market value should fall. If the repayment probability goes up, even by a small amount, then the market value should rise. You might be asking whether or not any of this matters. In most cases, these distinctions don't make a huge difference. If you're under time pressure, you can certainly simplify and just include issuances and repayments to project debt and leave out all the business with discounts, premiums, and issuance fees. But interview questions on these topics could still come up. And if a company has a convertible bond or a bond that it issued at a big discount or premium, book value versus face value definitely matters. And you really want to make sure that you're calculating the cash interest expense or even the entire interest expense based on the face value of the bond, not the book value of the bond. So yes, you should be familiar with these concepts, but don't obsess over them too much. To do a quick recap and summary now, face value is the amount of debt that a company issues, pays interest on, and must repay upon maturity. And it's affected by issuances, principal repayments, and accrued or paid in kind interest. 
Book value is the debt that shows up on a company's balance sheet under liabilities and equity. It's affected by all those, plus issuance fees, the issuance discount or premium, and the amortization of both those items over time. And then the market value is what someone else would pay to buy the company's debt on the secondary market if it trades on that market and it changes based on interest rates and credit default risk of the issuer. That's it for our summary of book value versus market value versus face value of debt. Hopefully you now know a bit more about this topic and can answer interview questions about it more effectively.